This episode is brought to you by Arden Labs Education. Sign up today to learn advanced concepts in Go, Docker, Kubernetes, Terraform, and more. Visit ardenlabs.com forward slash education for more information. Welcome to the Arden Labs podcast. Our special guest today is Tobias Thiel. Tobias, man, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show today. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. Where are you coming from? Where Where are you right now? Where are you on the planet right now? I'm uh, more or less uh, pretty much in the middle of Germany in a, a city called Kassel. So that's, a, as I said, pretty much in the middle of Germany. So if you look up in the map and uh, search for the middle, and you find Kassel. <laughs> nice, man. Yeah. All right, we're going to... Give everybody the two minutes on what you're doing today, Tobias. Um, uh, what, what I'm doing, uh, where, where I'm working, or in, in general and private, and so. <laughs> I guess for now, kind of the tech stuff that you're doing, like yeah, where where you're working or what you're kind of working on. Oh yeah, I'm uh, currently working for Danic, and uh, Danic is the German uh, registry for the top level domain .de. And it's a non, uh, not for profit organization. So we have, have like, I guess, 17 million uh, .de domains, uh, which ranks us at, I guess, the third place in the amount of domains worldwide that we handle, which is pretty cool to work uh, at the place where you could uh, destroy your internet for your complete country if you do something <laughs> wrong. <laughs> I hope that never happens. <laughs> I'm working there for like two months now. <laughs> So I have plenty of time to destroy our internet here. <laughs> and uh, when I'm not uh, uh, working for um, on my day-to-day -day job, I'm also a barkeeper in a local club uh, around the corner. And uh, also I'm an author of a book. <laughs> so that's uh, pretty much what I'm doing. Oh yeah, it's the uh, first, uh, officially first book about TinyGo called uh, Creative DIY Microcontroller Project with TinyGo and WebAssembly. A short pregnant title. <laughs> That's crazy. So you work as a software developer for a top level domain organization. And then when you're not doing that, you're working on WebAssembly and microcontrollers with TinyGo. Which is a, it's a really awesome topic. Also, you can do lots of funny things like build some WebAssembly page uh, which you can open up on, on your smartphone. So when you uh, you wake up and you're, oh, I need coffee, open your WebAssembly page, click a button and the coffee machine uh, starts brewing your coffee. That's nice. <laughs> You've done all that already? You've done those integration? Uh, yeah, I've done, I've done it, but uh, I changed the system because um, the, the, my first attempt was to, um, <laughs> I, you, you can't uh, tell anybody, you know, it, it, I directly uh, put um, a thing into the power socket uh, and uh, work with that. And that's not a good idea. Do not do it. You, you can buy, <laughs> you know, adapters, uh, which you can, which have APIs you can talk to. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. You're about to like blow up the entire house. So you built your own little device and you plugged it into the socket to turn things on and off. At, uh... I guess it's not, not a really good idea. As I said, uh, you can buy um, an adapter for like $10 or euros or wherever you come from and talk to it via an API. That's more safe. Yeah, but what's what's the fun in that if you can't blow something up? Or, or plus, you didn't die. You're good, bro. You didn't get electrocuted. Oh, yeah. I, I guess I was always a fan of not dying when drinking coffee. <laughs> you need to put the blueprints of this thing up on the internet so everybody can have their own. More. You know, DIY. You should have put it in the book or something. <laughs> yeah, I especially I did not put it in the book on purpose because <laughs> I was afraid that some houses burn down and, and then people tell me, well, it is, it's Tobias' fault. <laughs> you got to find a scapegoat for that. That's, that's Do it at the office. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I, I want to get to how you got started with Tiny Go, but we're not there yet. We, we got to work our way to, to that story in the book. Uh, this is a podcast about you, but it's also kind of about your journey. 
and how you got to where you are today. So I've got to age you a little bit. And, and being in Germany, you know, the grade school education is a little different. So what year was it when you were um, able to go to university? I, and I don't know if you went to university yet or not. Don't answer that. But what year would it have been when it was time for you to choose, say, university? Uh, that would have been 2012, I guess. <laughs> okay. 2012, and you would have been, at that point, like 16, 17, which is 17, 18? Uh, uh, 18. Yeah, I guess it 18. was 18, 18 or 19, so, so, something like that. <laughs> okay. So 18, in 2012, you're 18. Okay. That's always a good reference for me. Now, Here's a question. My, my, one of my favorite questions, I love to ask all of my software engineering guests this question. Okay, now clear your mind. Don't think hard. Okay, don't think hard. The very first memory that pops in your head uh, of you working on a computer and having one of those sort of like aha moments. Could have been anything, but like you just knew that this was like the thing that you wanted to be um, working on. It's a cool thing. I, um, I guess I, I was asked pretty often uh, what is the first thing I did with the computer or something like that. And um, I guess I was around, around about four years old. And my father handed me a Commodore 64, you know, C64 uh, computer, plugged it in the TV, gave me that huge keyboard and, you know, that huge floppy disk thing. <laughs> and also a, a, little, a, a little note with some commands. And I... I couldn't really read at, <laughs> at that age, and uh, also I couldn't uh, speak a single word of English. And yeah, <laughs> so I had a, a note, uh, and I, uh, with some commands like load uh, Geos or Geos uh, uh, operating system. And so I took uh, this note and uh, searched the letter on the keyboard and one for one copied what was on the note to the screen and uh, launched it. Okay, but you don't remember that. Wait, time out. You don't, you were four. You don't remember that. This is a story that you've been told. Possibly. Right? <laughs> you know, you brought something up that in all the years that I'm doing the show, well, at least within the two years I'm doing the show, the idea that you didn't speak English, but English is still a very prevalent sort of language that you have to use in anything you're doing with computers, right? And you're the first person to kind of say, you know, I didn't know English, but I had to type in all this English and I didn't know what it meant. Uh, but you saw what was happening. But there's no way you remember that. You remember, you remember, or do you think your memories just come from hearing the story? Yeah, that's possible, yeah. <laughs> that my but, memories come from hearing it. But I want to, okay, so give me something that you, you know for sure is a memory. Like, you know, within a reasonable sort of age that you remember doing something I guess it must be my, my first uh, real computer that I shared with my brother. So I guess I was about seven or eight years old and my uh, father bought a PC from my uncle because my uncle bought a brand new PC for like 2000 mark. That was around about $2,000 at the time. And he didn't know what to do with it. So he got a monitor, a keyboard, you know, everything, <laughs> everything he needed at that time. And he didn't know what to do with it. So he had a computer for a whole lot of money and didn't know what to do. And so, so my father, who had a, a Commodore 64 and some other Atari machines and so on uh, in, in the past, knew what to do with it. So he bought it for like $100 uh, from my uncle <laughs> three weeks later. And then uh, he simply uh, 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 set it up <clears throat> and uh, allowed my brother and me to use it. And uh, that thing was, I, I don't know, it had around 33 megahertz and uh, like 500, 600 megabytes of disk space and so on. And we wanted, yeah, we wanted to run games on it, you know, so very basic games at that time. So um, we had to delete, it ran Windows 95, I guess. We had to delete files <laughs> from somewhere <laughs> to run the game. So we read through, through the computer to the file system and system 42 and deleted random files just to get enough space to install a game, which worked, obviously, but when we restarted the computer, nothing was working anymore. 
So this happened like two or three times, and then my my, my father told us how to install Windows ninety five on our own, so we can <laughs> can destroy it to the to install games. I have questions here. Okay, first question is: Is your brother older or yeah, younger? Three years older. Three years older. Okay, and were you? somewhat worried or scared when the computer wouldn't restart after you were done you of course both father. of us were worried <laughs> we thought we, <laughs> we thought we've destroyed it <laughs> what did your father what was your father's first sort of reaction when you were like did you ever tell him or you just waited for him to turn on the computer and you were like i don't know dad oh i guess it was uh, <laughs> really like uh, uh we waited just we just waited for him to turn it on and and I think he was a little bit pissed because it, it took quite a long time to reinstall Windows. <laughs> but you did it again, so yeah. <laughs> you didn't learn your life for the first time. We've did it. We've really? done it like three times or so until he told us, uh, taught us how to do it ourselves. <laughs> yeah, that was. So I, I'm just curious what your father did for a living. I guess he was technical. Oh uh, no no no. He's like, a, 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 oh, what's in English, a, a craftsman. He's uh, painting walls and, uh, and stuff like that. So nothing to do with technique. But he had a love for it because he had it in the house. Was it, okay, did he spend time on that machine like you did? Or do you think he bought it for you boys? I guess he, he bought it for us boys because uh, the most of the time we spend it uh, playing games like, I guess uh, one of the first games was Monkey Island 2 or 3 or something like that. Exceptionally, a great game. That's really forward thinking of your father that he saw this as something important and invested that time and money into it. Well, I guess it was a good idea. I mean, I become a software engineer later on. <laughs> could have. Is your brother a software engineer too? What does your brother do? Oh, he chose the same job as my father at the same company. <laughs> nice. Okay, so your brother went into the trades. Yeah, into the into the trades, and you, wow, God, I have so many questions there. Okay, but before we get there, before we get there, before we get there, because your brother and you are, I would imagine at the time at, at the same level of technical, right? Like, you know, but at some point he's got to decide what to do. Um, at seventeen, eighteen, and he decides to go the trades route. You decide not to go a trades route, so. I'm I'm kind of curious there. Well, before I ask that question, I, I got to ask another question because I like sort of asking this question. What else, when you were 14, 15, 16, 17, when you're in that age, age group, right? Th th those four sort of years, what other things were you into? Were you in, I see some guitars in the background if you're not watching the YouTube. So I'm guessing that you were into music. You had a band back then, like talk a little bit about those other interests? I always wanted to learn uh, playing the guitar, but at the age of uh, 14, 15, 16, I had other things in my mind, <laughs> like partying and stuff. But also I was pretty much into gaming itself and uh, into game development. I uh, pretty early tried to, to start to write my own small games because my dream at that time was to become a game developer. Ah, so as you're, we call it high school in the US. So sorry for me, I, I know, Things do, but as you're in those quote unquote high school years, you're thinking that you're going to graduate and get into being a software developer, but in the gaming industry. Oh, that was more or less my plan. But um, I also, in the I, I tell called equivalent of high school in Germany, I also choose um, a computer science as a, a course which was pretty cool because I learned C++ there. So I learned, uh, learned the basics of programming there, which was good because uh, everything I know knew before was self-taught. And uh, <laughs> if, if you'd see my code <laughs> in the past, it was awful. Well, that's, I mean, it should be awful, right? You're learning. I, I'm super curious about your brother. Was he just was he just not into it as much as you were at the time? Or do you think he was just too late? Um, I don't think he was too late. I guess he was just not that into it. He's into gaming and, and stuff, but he was all, also the guy who bought like um, uh, uh, a ride or something like that. And then spent time uh, on working on it, uh, like exchanging parts on the engine and, and stuff like that. So it was, Ah, he got into the cars. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, he was uh, pretty much uh, was his love. I, I also don't know why he didn't choose to be a car technician because I guess he would be good at it. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. So well, well, I tried to spend time to learn how to write games. He spent time on on a car and stuff like that. So at some point, that computer kind of becomes yours. At some point, you're spending the majority. How long did it take for you to get that computer in your room, or was it always in your room? I guess it, it did take quite a few years uh, because uh, my father from time to time bought a new computer and then his old computer was gifted to my older brother and then <laughs> the computer we shared was gifted to me and then, you know, a, a few years later, my father bought a new computer <laughs> and so <laughs> I always held, had the oldest computer in the house. <laughs> That's amazing to me again that your your father is constantly upgrading. He, I mean, have you ever sat and asked him and talked to him about that affinity that he had, that love that he had, or what was what was up with him? Or you already know that answer, you know, because... Oh, he's uh, just fascinated with Technic. I, I don't really understand why he didn't choose to work in this uh, section, but uh, like he also, he's also building custom ROMs for smartphones, uh, for different smartphones on in his free time. Or uh, also he, someday he le learned a little bit of Python, which uh, helped him to do that stuff. He also was the first one to show me, oh God, uh, uh, I guess it was an open SUSE uh, distribution or something like that. So he was the first one to show me Linux. He also was the first one to show me how to install some Mac OS on a normal computer, which resulted in him throwing the computer out of the window, literally. <laughs> <laughs> this is mind blowing. Have you ever asked, asked him Dad, why haven't you, why didn't you ever change careers or go into a technical, like, it would be a, an amazing question to kind of ask him and to get his kind of thoughts about that. And I never asked him. I guess he has just a safe job, which is paying his bills and he never tried it, but uh, I, I bet he could work in tech because of his passion for it. I have no doubt he can work in tech if he was doing all those things. But the next time you talk talk to him, you got to ask him that question because okay. <laughs> I, I think it's I think it would be fascinating to kind of hear hear his thoughts on that. And I'm assuming he's still tinkering today. Yeah, he also uh, uh, always told me, "Don't go into the trades. You're just destroying your body, and, and you don't earn that much, and so on." He always told me. <laughs> As you're nearing um, that decision now. Yeah, right, because you got to. I think I remember in Germany, you got to take that test, and that determines. Is that how that works again in Germany? You, you take a test, and that kind of determines. Uh, you do something equivalent to high school, and then your grades decide which um, uh, um, on which kind of course on the university you could go to because there are restrictions. If your grades are too bad, you can't go and study medicine, for example. But the good news uh, was that. Um, uh, computer science did not have any restrictions. They had other filters in place to get rid of students. <laughs> so you knew you were going to go study computer science and you had the grades at least, or there were no filters. So it wasn't, it wasn't, there was no obstacle and you knew that's what you wanted to do. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, I had pretty bad grades, but I knew there is no restriction on the grades to start to go study computer science. <laughs> Did you want to go decent, like far away from university or did you want to stay home? Like what were your choices? Oh, that was pretty easy. My choices. Um, I, I always lived near Kassel and I had friends here and they said the university here, um, isn't that great. So I had other friends in a city called Marburg and, uh, the other, my old friend said, oh, it's a great university, nice professors and you know, nice locations to go partying and so on. So I choose Marburg, which was like a hundred kilometer. That's, a, I guess, about 80 miles away from my parents. Yeah, like an hour and a half car ride. Yeah, that's cool. So it's where party keeps coming up. So you really wanted to enjoy life while you're younger. <laughs> so yeah. this, this university program, is, is that like a four-year program when you when you get into that? Oh, it's uh, three years and a half if you are on time and uh, do everything as planned from the university. But uh, I'm not sure how it's in America, but you can also be a, st a st um, student for like 
10 years, you could study for 10 years without getting a degree in Germany. <laughs> oh my goodness. But you must have had it in your head that you're going to get, you want to get into industry, I imagine. So you're going to do your three and a half years um, and then probably try to get, so yeah. So t talk to me about the university and the things that you were learning from a computer science perspective. Do you, I mean, are you feeling at the time that this is a waste of time? Do you look back on it now and realize it isn't like, talk a little bit about that. Oh yeah, when I um, so when I um, moved to Marburg to start uh, to start studying there to the university, after like a year or so, I realized it isn't uh, always the best idea to leave the house at uh, leave your parents' house at eighteen years old and live on your own and get uh, get your stuff done on your own, um, because uh, I, I realized after a year or so that um, it's beneficial uh, to have a year or so before uh, before st starting to study to get to know how to live on your own because uh, it was time consuming uh, learning how to cook learning how to clean <laughs> clean do my laundry and so on and so on and so on you know the typical stuff you do as an adult <clears throat> and so i moved out had to learn all of this and uh, also had my university stuff and we learned programming languages like java haskell scala and so on and it was uh, pretty much uh, i guess the biggest part of it was theory so i always wanted to you know get uh, get stuff done get my hands dirty and program uh, things and in the university it was theory and theory and theory over and over and also math and i'm not that good at maths <laughs> so but you must have been coding projects like what was one of the sort of cool projects you did at university there had to be something you were coding oh yeah um a side project in my free time, <laughs> not related to university, was uh, <laughs> to develop a small game, which helped me uh, to get through university stuff. But cool projects to do at university, oof, I guess, uh, well, is, uh, is um, a simple uh, user management system where you can register and then log in and change password and so uh, such stuff of uh, projects were um, being used early on. And the reason I didn't have any more complex uh, projects there is because uh, I dropped out of university after two years. <laughs> oh, so after two years you were, so talk to me about that. What was, why that decision and what were you thinking you were going to do or did you already have something lined up and that's why you left? I realized that I want to get my, as I said, I want to get my hands dirty. I want to program and develop stuff instead of uh, learning the theory and, and, and so on. So I, it took me some weeks to, to think about it. And at some point I just said, oh, well, okay, <laughs> I'm just stopping it and uh, starting, um, uh, how's it called in English? Um, some, uh, being an, uh, apprenticeship, start an apprenticeship. An apprenticeship. Yeah. Like an internship or yeah, apprenticeship. Exactly. It's, and in Germany, it's like a, you need three years where you're being trained how to do software engineering and uh, also work um, on a day-to-day, -day on a normal job while being trained how to do it. So, okay, wait a second. So instead of going university track, they had the option of doing this as an apprentice. So you could just jump into a, into a work environment. Uh, on a university track, it would have also been possible to do something like that, you know, where you work half the time and study half the time, but I didn't choose to do it. So I just dropped out of university and started this apprenticeship. So two questions there. One, do you stay where you are when you do this apprenticeship? Do you go back home? And what are your parents saying to you as you're dropping out of university? Oh, I didn't, tell, I didn't tell them at that time. I did, I did not tell them. I didn't financial, financially rely on them. And uh, at first I just didn't tell them. I, I guess I told them when I finished this apprenticeship. <laughs> okay. So time out. You must have found the apprenticeship before you left university. Right. Yeah, I, I did. You, you must. Okay. And this was paid. So that gave you the ability to continue to live wherever you were living. Yeah, exactly. At some point, your father's asking you for your grades and you're like, dad, I got to sit down and tell you something. <laughs> <laughs>
I'd love. I want to be a fly on the wall for this one. I guess um, it's um, the my, my parents are, were always more or less proud of me because I was the first in the family to go to university and stuff. And I don't think they were sad that I stopped it uh, uh, at some point and the dropout because it's not like I was living on the streets and did nothing and fell into a hole, but I just had a new plan and was following it. So as I told them, I don't think they were sad and they were still proud, I think, because I was going on my way. You were still being productive and you didn't like just, yeah, so that's fair. Uh, maybe they were a little disappointed you didn't get the, de you weren't going to get the degree, but um, so what is this apprenticeship that you find? What, what is the job? What are you doing? Oh, we were developing um, a client and uh, server. Uh, uh, so we had a client server based architecture and it was a product for um, document management system. So there was a server running on some Windows server virtual machines and we had to develop um, C sharp code using .NET framework free. I guess, which is pretty old. It was already pretty old when I started that. So we uh, tried to make it uh, very easy to um, to archive documents uh, with uh, metadata. That's more or less the simplification of it. This had to be 2014? Yeah, around around that, yeah. I started the apprenticeship and 2013, it's, yeah. Was it hard to get an apprenticeship or is it just something you, it's part of the government program? It was actually pretty easy. I applied for free uh, positions and uh, everyone gave me a contract I could sign and uh, I signed the worst pay contract. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What was your pay on this contract? Is it like, what is it? $10 an hour, $5 an hour, $20? Oh, less than that. Uh, less than $10 an hour. I guess I have to calculate it. It was like, I guess. 600 um about 600 dollars a month for, for yeah not not re not really enough to to live with uh, to live with from but uh, also too much to die so it was okay at the time <laughs> but this is like three months right a three month apprenticeship uh no no it's a three years apprenticeship normally but i i went a special path <laughs> oh three years yeah so, yeah at at bad pay, but how long are you at this company? Uh, I was at this company for four and a half years, I guess. Whoa. Okay. I mean, it's a long time, dude. Did you, I guess you grew inside the company at, at some point you were actually making some good money and you must've been working on some good project or is it the same product for four and a half years? It was the same product for four and a half years, but uh, the, I guess the, the thing that made me sign the worst paying contract of the three I had to choose from was the, the great team. I had an exceptionally great uh, trainer, I guess that's the correct word, who was uh, really experienced and also very willing to teach his knowledge, to share his knowledge and to teach us uh, trainees how to do stuff and how to do it right. So I had a really, really cool team there. How did you recognize that? in an, even in a 60 minute interview, how did you recognize that that company and that team was going to be what you needed to kind of grow in your career? And the other two jobs where I applied, everyone was wearing suits, you know, suits. That <laughs> 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 they, 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 they were paying pretty nice and had really cool projects to work on. And so I go, uh, went to this other interview. <laughs> And there's, uh, um, and there was the, the boss of the company uh, normally in a suit. Okay. That's fine for me. And then my, my trainer and he was wearing uh, shorts and a t-shirt. <laughs> so that was my first really good impression of him. Then he also said, uh, um, uh, he played the game that I uh, uploaded uh, with my application. So I was developing games every free time and he played it. And also everyone else on the dev team was, uh, <laughs> has been playing the game. So we also, he was uh, talking about how cool the game was and uh, what bugs he encountered and what he would change. And I, I just realized his love for software. Okay. Time out. This game that was part of your CV, did you build that while you were at university? And what, yeah. what was this game? What was it about? <laughs> Um, I, I don't really know if, is there, if there really is a genre for, for that uh, type of game. It's something like a tower defense like game, but with a single, I call it tower because there was no tower. You had uh, 
you know, it was a um, 2D game. You had uh, like five lanes and on these lanes from the right side, enemies uh, were moving to the left side and they shouldn't um, pass your finish line. And if they pass the finish line, you lost the life. And you could spawn golems, like an earth golem, a fire golem, and an ice golem, which had special effects like freezing the enemy to slow them down or give them burn uh, damage, which uh, the damage over time. And the earth golems just uh, had a ton of HP. And later on, I also added dragons, which um, burned the co all five rows and so on and so on and so on. So it was a pretty cool project. What did you write that game in? Was it written in C Sharp? Oh no, it was written in Java with um, the, it's not really an engine, uh, oh, it's, it's a game engine, it's called uh, libgdx, gdx. It's a pretty, pretty cool uh, engine, it's uh, where you also learn about how OpenGL and stuff like that works. And I was also able to deploy it to, um, as an Android app, which was pretty nice. When did you have, okay, two two questions. One, when did you have time to build this? I guess you weren't going to class, right? <laughs> <laughs> and um, does the game still work? Can we play it today? I've uh, uh, I've uploaded it to GitHub. I guess there are also the uh, .apk files and it should be able to run on, on, on Android devices, even on modern Android devices. Also, I... And may maybe also exported a jar, so it should be runnable still. I, I need you to get this game working so we can see this, because obviously during the the interview they loved the game, and that was probably a big a big selling point to have you on the team. Though we didn't get you any extra money, but that's okay. Yeah, well, it, I guess it was a really good selling point because normally if you start an apprenticeship, um, most of the people have zero knowledge. And so they got uh, someone who had at least some university knowledge and also is able to develop a game. So I guess uh, that was a huge credit. Right. But you were moving, you were going into a C-sharp shop, which again, is object oriented programming. So it wasn't a big deal. Yeah, I, I mean, C-sharp is more or less... I guess I'm going to get lynched after this, but uh, C Sharp is just like Java, so it was easy to get into C Sharp. Uh, I hear you. I hear you. So, in the four years that you're there, what what happens with your career? Like, you started as an apprentice. What was the last title you had going into that year four? software architect and uh, at the same time i was leading the team because my the, the former team leader left dude in four years you became an architect for the products that they were building there i i'm in the four years i became software architect and also uh, did a certification with the isaqb uh, you know the international software architecture qualification board that's the name <laughs> You did four and a half years. So what's happening in that year four, now that you're this architecture, a pretty much a senior engineer in this company, what happens? You get bored or something, something comes, because now we're talking about 2018-ish, maybe 19. We're about to head into uh, COVID years here. So Oh, that that was uh, well pre-COVID. Uh, what happened is um, we had uh, uh, I went to developer conferences and uh, learned how other people are doing software. So you know how um, how to get requ good requirements, what are good requirements, and so what what is a what should a development process looks like uh, look like. And uh, that was, it was at that point I realized <laughs> there's so much wrong at the company <laughs> that I decided to leave. Did the company send you to this conference? Yeah. <laughs> so basically, they sent you to a conference and lost you. Yeah. And also, they, paid, they paid to have you gone. <laughs> yeah, they, they lost me and also all my colleagues afterwards. <laughs> so what are we teaching business owners at this point don't send don't send your 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 staff to a conference <laughs> <laughs> well i thought uh, i thought don't send them to a conference or uh, listen to what they are telling you after the conference <laughs> oh is that what happened you came back and you said we got to do this and we got to do that and they were like no and then everybody said, Get. so did you find the next company from this conference or do you just wake up one morning and say i'm going to put my cv out there 
Oh, I, I went to a co-op meetup, and uh, uh, what uh, really attracted me is they had beer. <laughs> <laughs> is this your first meetup at this point? This is like 2018. Yeah, that was my, uh, I guess it was really the first meetup I attended ever. Which meetup was this again? Kotlin, you said? Uh, it was called a Castle Code Meetup. It uh, wasn't uh, any language specific. So it was just about coding in general. And was, uh, well, the company I then <laughs> went to uh, hold this uh, meetup. So. It was a pretty interesting uh, uh, <laughs> process because I went to the meetup. They told us, well, we are looking for software engineers. Some days later, I thought, hmm, why not? So I didn't call them, didn't write an email. I just went there straight into the office and said, well, does anyone of you know Alexander? <laughs> he told us he has jobs. And then they sent us to, to another office in the same building. And then I, had my, <laughs> I was hired <laughs> on place. <laughs> Oh my God, dude, this company basically decided to educate their staff and lost everyone yeah. in the process. <laughs> this is mind blowing. And you're saying it's not, you would have stayed there if they were willing to adapt and to try out some of these new things, but they just weren't. Oh, definitely. Because I had a really, really cool dev team. We were like, I guess at the end, around six or seven people for one product. It was a really cool dev team. We had lots of fun. But uh, everything around it was not good. So what were they thinking? Like, like we're going to educate people, but we're not going to let them use the education. It seems, I don't know, the math doesn't add up there. It's wild. So how many days was it from the time you went to the conference to the time that you ended up leaving? It must have been around half a year, maybe a little longer. Okay. So within six months of all that, you find, and then you go to the meetup and then you're like, let me just try it out. So I, I'm also curious, I don't need numbers here, but I, I imagine that the new job brought a decent raise. Oh, no, no. 10, 20, 30% raise? No? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I had a decrease uh, or an initial decrease of 30% in my payment. What? <laughs> what was it that you found so appealing that you took a pay cut to to go? Oh, it, uh, again, they had a really, really, really cool team, cool people, a pretty young team. It was a startup. And I guess today I wouldn't really join startups again, but at that time, I guess it was just what I needed. Uh, <laughs> so they told me about all this cool new technology like uh, Docker and Kubernetes and uh, this and that and the uh, build pipelines and automatic deployments and wow. I was totally flashed. I wanted to do all of this. <laughs> you were able to still afford to live even with the pay cut because that's a significant pay cut. You said like, pretty... dude, that's amazing. Yeah. And uh, I had this pay cut for, for like half a year. And then I had the first race and like three months later, I had a, a, another race and then wo I was at my previous level again. And from that. But there was no guarantee of that. That just happened. That just happened. Um, they didn't, did they promise even that during the interview? No. no, no. So they saw how good you were and they didn't want, they didn't want to lose you. And they got exactly. you back to where you were. Uh, after six months, they, they directly um, promoted me to team lead. And from that point on, I hired my own team. It was pretty cool. Uh, I, I, I'm just curious, were you, at the time you take this job and this pay cut, did you have a partner in your life? Was there somebody that you were living with? And so now you have to go to this person and say, um, we're going to, I'm going to take this pay cut. What, what were they saying? Uh, she didn't have a problem with us because, uh, I was, um, uh, even today I'm not living in a pretty big house or expensive, uh, you know, apartment. I'm, <laughs> she always said I'm, I'm, I'm living like, uh, I wasn't, uh, earning a single cent a day. <laughs> So I don't need that much money to live. Uh, so we didn't lose any, yeah, we, we didn't lose anything. We just had a little bit less money, but it did not have any impact to, in our day-to-day -day life. So that's great. So, so she was really supportive with the, the idea that you needed to learn all this tech. If anything, it was like, I know that this is going to be the skills that we're going to need also moving forward. Um, so what did your partner do? What, what was her job at the time? Is she technical too? 
Oh, <laughs> no, she's not technical. Uh, she was also, she was studying at a university. Like, uh, I guess it's called sociology or something like that. Uh, sociology and politics. Oh, yeah. Okay. So you want to like do social work or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Okay. All right. So how long are you at this company now learning Kubernetes, GitHub and all the other stuff? How long are you there? Uh, I, I was there for nearly five years. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Time out. Because that puts us like now, 2023. So, yeah, yeah. So you've been basically at two companies so far in your career. You've been in, the, in that first one. More or less uh, currently in the third one. Yeah, well, we're not there yet. So, okay. So talk to me then. So you start this job pre-COVID. I imagine everybody's going to an office at that point. Talk to me about when sort of COVID hits in this job. And now I imagine it becomes completely remote, right? How, how does the team, how did you and the team adapt to, to that sort of change? That was uh, working pretty well. We had uh, already um, pre-COVID established uh, Slack as a communication, to, uh, communication tool and also Teams as a video uh, conference tool because we had um, uh, peers uh, that didn't live in Germany or in, in Kassel uh, where the company was. So we already had experience with remote work. So when COVID hit, uh, we first had some complicated rules like you can only enter through this door and only leave through this door and stuff like that. And uh, pretty fast, we decided to just shut down the office and uh, tell everybody to stay at home because it was no fun to work there anymore. And that worked out pretty well. Actually, you know, I never asked what the company did or built. Like what, what were you building and what tech were you working on at the time or languages and stuff? At that at that job, I learned Go because I have never heard of Go before. And when I applied there, they said, oh, we are doing Go, by the way, do you know Go? And I said, I've never heard of it, <laughs> but I can learn it. <laughs> so we were building software for um, big uh, banks and stuff like that uh, and insurance companies because um, in uh, Germany and Europe, we have the Anti-Money Laundering Act, so they have to comply to it. And in the past, they did it on paper. They wrote stuff on paper. They had like this huge fix with thousand pages of paper for a single customer. And they took months for their checks, uh, which they obligated to do based on uh, the law. And we said, well, we could do this in like less than a second because it's pretty easy to get the data digitally and give you all everything you need. And that's worked out pretty well. Yeah, you... you got to that company when they were just starting to build this tech, right? Oh, yeah. The company had uh, other products, but when I joined, uh, we, um, they just wanted to start uh, this new product. So I was the first developer for this product. Uh, in Go, and you never wrote Go before. Exactly. <laughs> so I'm curious, like, one, how you felt. I, obviously, you were okay with that. Did you just think, this is another programming language I'll put under my belt? Or had you been hearing about Go already and it was something that... I have never before heard about Go. <laughs> and uh, in my, in my, um, at my, there was uh, something like a trial day and it was awful because I brought a PC running Windows and at that time Go on Windows with Visual Studio Code. Oh my God, it wasn't <laughs> working out pretty well. But um, I... I quickly learned that uh, Go is so simple that you can learn it pretty fast. So it wasn't that much uh, of a problem to, well, start a new pro learn a new programming language and start to build a new product. I'm just curious because you did a bunch of object-oriented programming in your background. Were you feeling like this was a better programming environment for you or, you, or were you missing? I missed Link when I first switched from C-sharp to Go. Because I lived in Link with all the data structures, right? And I had to rethink about how I manipulated data. You must have had some of those sort of challenges early on. Oh, yeah. The, my, one of my biggest challenges was um, finding a good project structure and good architectures because I was there like, okay, I'm just defining some interfaces and abstract base classes and stuff like that. And we don't have abstract base classes in Go. And uh, interfaces work uh, another way than in C-sharp. So... 
that was a challenge for me at the beginning. And then uh, I went to YouTube, <laughs> searched uh, Go project structure, and was uh, and luckily found a pretty decent talk about uh, structuring Go applications. And then you're the first person on this team. So I imagine over time, this team, this team sort of grows and you're able to get something in production to start sort of solving that problem. I, I guess we, it took about half a year to, to get it into the production with the first customer. And you were running that in Kubernetes out of the, you know, day one. Uh, yeah. And I didn't do Docker before. I didn't do any, <laughs> I didn't know about Kubernetes before. So it was first time everything. <laughs> That's amazing. What were your first impressions? I think Docker is just super cool, right? So my guess is like light bulbs go on with that. But what, what were some of your first impressions with Kubernetes? Did you have to do the ops side too? Oh, luckily, I didn't have to do the ops side. Uh, we had an ops team. And luckily, they were also willing to share knowledge because the first time I saw Docker, I said, I don't understand a single word. <laughs> <laughs> But that's fair. You're not born with Docker, you know. Every I tell I tell this to people all the time, especially people who are new in the industry. Like nobody that you're looking up to right now was born with this information. Everybody had to learn it. Yeah, you know. And, and so don't don't feel like you're behind. Uh, yeah, exactly. And on the previous company, we had to um, uh, install and create new virtual machines on a. A Hyper-V thing and install Windows on there and then configure it. And then on the new company, uh, it was like, well, we can start a Docker container. That's amazing. <laughs> How does your sort of career progress in those five years, right? You start as a, I guess you're starting as a software developer on a team, but kind of where, where are you five years later? Uh, yeah, five years later, I, I was the more... I, I was able to choose my own title after half a year, so I was called the princess. <laughs> <laughs> they said, you, you can't get uh, whatever title you want. Uh, I said, I want to be the princess. <laughs> and we just read with it. <laughs> yeah, what was the last project you worked on over there? Oh, one of the last projects I worked on was... Um, integrating the German transparency register and uh, the transparency register gave us data about every company that's registered in Germany. So that's like a registry of companies and companies are obligated to put their data into this registry. And if you want to open a bank account as a company, you need, need to know who's the ultimate beneficial owner. So who ultimately owns the company and runs it. And so um, we try to get data out of it. But if you were ever to Germany, digitalization is a hard topic here because uh, Germans don't like it for some reason. So when the when the, the country uh, let um, anyone build some software, you you know it's shit. So it didn't have an API. We have <laughs> it had to be scraped from a pretty awful slow website. <laughs> it was an awful project. But the good news is um, they. Do I guess they have two more years until they have to provide an API for for this shit? <laughs> and then all that code you wrote goes away, essentially. Yeah, but but that's fine. The code wasn't pretty at all. I I, I don't know if I've ever seen a pretty scra web scraper. <laughs> then tell me what happens on year five because you seem to be one of these people that sort of land in a job and you're giving it a lot of time, right? You're not bouncing around, so. What happens in, I'm guessing 2000, I guess this year, 2023, right? So what happens in that you now are in this new position and what is the company like? Um, now I'm at uh, Danik, which uh, where we do uh, completely other stuff. No more um, uh, anti-money laundering act and no more banks and insurance companies, which is pretty nice. So um, yeah, well, what happened, I, I got, uh, Someday I, I just lost my interest in my job. You know, if you, I don't know if you ever had the feeling in a job that you woke up in the morning and, and thought like, oh, I don't want to work anymore on this job. I don't want to do my tasks anymore. It was just like, I just don't want to work there anymore. And then I had this feeling for about two to three weeks. Um, then I talked to my boss, told him, hey, I'm sorry, but I don't want to work here anymore. And um, 
we are still um, uh, also my um, previous boss and I, we are good friends still, <laughs> even though I left him. <laughs> but yeah. well, yeah, so I at some point decided to leave the job and then you know if you know linkedin this uh, social network thingy for <laughs> uh, i just opened it uh, um, changed to looking for a job and then you know you get thousands of requests from headhunters wait 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 you left the job before you had a new job you were just like burnt out and you told your boss i'm burnt out and what did your boss say when you said i'm burnt out like he said I, I I don't know how that conversation goes because you're, are you going in and talking to the the boss with the idea that you want to change what you're doing or really did you go in there trying to be a good person and just say I'm burnt out and I'm leaving? Uh, more or less, uh, I just really told him I'm burnt out and I'm leaving and uh, he realized that there's nothing he can do to change my opinion anymore. So he just accepted it. But you left without having another position already. Oh, uh, um, I stayed there uh, until I have another position. It's also what I told him. So I told him before I um, quit that I'm uh, going to quit soon. So he also has time to start to look for something new before I um, telling, tell him he, that I quit. So uh, that's nice. Yeah. So it was easier for them to find a replacement. No, it's totally fair. I, 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 that's the way you got to do it, right? You don't want to burn bridges. The world world is too small but you had no idea where you wanted to go you were you didn't have any sort of idea of project or company so you decided to go on linkedin to start looking at how do you use linkedin linkedin to find a job because i don't understand this website i i accept anybody that wants to follow me but i do not understand I also do not understand this website, but the good thing is what I do understand is headhunters writing me messages on LinkedIn. That's what I do understand. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, as I said, it changed. You, you, they have some kind of drop down where you can, yeah, I'm open for hire and stuff like that. So I choose that. And uh, like a day later, I started to get hundreds of messages from people that just sending me job offers. So I use that way. And how long did it take? For you to this is wait wait that you're talking about okay when did you start that process was it last year like near the end of last year or the beginning of this year? i started it this year because this is like the worst year to try to find a job with a hundred thousand people that sort of lost their job if you had told me you were going to do this i would have been panicking i would say tobias slow down man because there's a hundred thousand people out there looking for work and nobody's hiring um, and you decided to do this in the worst job market ever. And how long did it take you to find a, find a position? Oh, it must have been something, but I, I guess like four weeks. It took like four weeks. And when did you, st this was like in January, February? Um, in May. In May. No, no, no. The in March. Of... I signed the contract in March. It was in March. In the in beginning March. of March, I started it. And at the end of March, I had the contract. And you weren't worried at all about how long this could take just because of the industry where it was? Not really, because I didn't quit until I had the new offer. So I yeah, wasn't worried, yeah, yeah, yeah. worried. Please tell me you didn't take another pay cut to move, though. Oh, no, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. Not okay. this time. <laughs> I've done it right this time. I've done it really right this time. <laughs> I've, I thought I was insane when, when, when they asked me what, what I was expecting as a wage and I, I gave them my numbers and they just said yes. <laughs> and I thought, I thought I was pokering high and they, I'm going to tell me, yeah, well, you need to settle lower. But well, it just worked out. That's amazing. What an amazing story to hear because I'm seeing people with amazing CVs really struggling. Now, I don't know if they're struggling because their salary requirements are now out of whack because I think the industry is resetting um, salaries. So if you're within that range, I guess you're okay. If you're still trying to get last year's numbers, um, I'm seeing people really struggle. Yeah, um, I guess also you, you can't really compare German salaries with American salaries. There's uh, like, uh, we are lower, like we have one third, more or less half or a third of that to what the American companies pay. But also, it's uh, uh, cheaper to live in Germany. You don't have to pay for university, healthcare is free, and so on and so on and so on. So, what is this job now that you just walked into? I'm guessing it's a Go programming job. Yeah. Like, right. 
we talked a little bit at the beginning of the podcast, but remind remind me again of the problem that you're working on. Oh yeah, so um, Denik is the um, only and official registry for the top level uh, domain DE. Top level so domain. yeah, right, for right, the top right. level domain of the German country. And um, Wait, what I'm this is a, this is a government or a private agency? It's a private agency, but it's a, a not for profit organization. So we're not doing it to to get rich like in other countries. So, but we're doing it to have well good and easy and, and more or less cheap access to domains and the free internet. I feel like these problems of domain registry and all that have been solved already because this is like a 20 year old problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but if you if you look at uh, what APIs they are still running on, and uh, there's not like you have one API and uh, everyone on the world is using it. You have more like two hundred APIs that are twenty years old, and no one wants to <laughs> work with it anymore. Well, what do I need an API for? So I can automate the the new registry of a domain. Yeah, exactly. What are these APIs for? Well, because pe people uh, want to go to some internet page and insert their domain there and then just click buy. That's what people want to do. And if you don't have an API or, <clears throat> or something like that or any website, well, it's hard for people to get that domain. At the beginning of, of the company of Denik, I guess it worked using emails. So they've sent emails there <laughs> and then you got your domain. <laughs> but you're not selling. You're not selling domains, you're managing the domains and you're trying to make it so like DN Simple can sell. Yeah, so, so we are managing what more or less what we do is providing an API for our members because this not for profit orga organization consists of like 300 members and they sell domains. So they talk to our API and register domains and we have the database and the name servers for it. I guess you get a piece of some sale. I mean, I know it's nonprofit, but money has to come in. So do you know what the revenue model is? Uh, yeah, I know, but I fear I'm not allowed to talk about it. <laughs> then let's not talk about it. <laughs> That's fine. Okay. And you've been there now almost, well, since March, right? So No, no, no. I, I signed the contract, but I started in July, on the 1st of July. Oh, you just got there. You just, you, you haven't, okay. You just got there. So then you took a, did you take a few months off then in between? Is that what you did? Uh, I only had one month off and I went uh, uh, to Spain for a week uh, on, <laughs> on the ocean and uh, did the holiday there, which was pretty nice. <laughs> you wrote a book about tiny go and web assembly and none of this has come up at all in any <laughs> job that you've had uh, since you started working in, in 2014. So you need to tell me how this happens. When does sort of TinyGo and WebAssembly come into your radar screen and when are you working on this stuff? Oh, that's, uh, I guess it's a pretty funny story. Um, um, a peer of mine uh, told me um, you can't uh, do Go on microcontrollers. I'm not pretty sure, quite sure how this conversation come up. What year? What year is this? We're talking like three years ago, four years ago. That must have been 2018. Okay. So 2018, you're with a buddy, you're having a drink, and they say you can't use run go on microcontrollers. And you say. And I said, I'm pretty sure it does. So we continue drinking the complete night. And uh, in the next day, I was totally hungover, but it, so I didn't care. On the next day, I pulled out my old Arduino, searched the internet and followed, found Tiny Go, and I was able to call him and say, come here right now. <laughs> <laughs> so he came to me and I showed him how I was able to get an LED to blink with Go. And at that point, I, I thought, hey, it should be possible to do more with it. And I started to love Go because of my job. So I wanted to play around with it, and I did. And I started a little GitHub repository, also called called Playground, where I tried out different things. And this is also the point where um, the publisher of the book uh, found me. So at some point in time, I suddenly got an email uh, where some guy named Alok is asking me, "Hey, do you want to do you want to write a, go, uh, a book about Go, about Tiny Go?" And I was like, "Hey." That must be spam, some scam. I don't know. I ignored it. 
And then uh, he was pretty consistent. So he found out my work email addresses. He found all, out all my private email addresses <laughs> and wrote emails to all of them. <laughs> and at uh, some point in time, I, I, I realized, oh, man, <laughs> I guess he really is working for a publisher and it's not a scam. So I told him, well, okay, tell me what you have me to tell. And uh, we set up an appointment. Writing a book, well, first of all, you have to find time to work on this stuff. So what hours of the day pr prior to this whole book thing, like what hours of the day are you working on learning tiny go at that point, you come home from work or is it the weekends or, or it was more or less only the weekends or maybe half an hour or an hour at, at the evening, because I also have a dog and, and so on and so on, you know, not that much time to do it. Well, you have a partner too. So is she like, she, I guess she's got things that she can work on. So she's not, upset that you're spending time on this stuff i i just guess she's happy that i have hobbies <laughs> <laughs> that's good so i'm always impressed with anybody who writes a book because it's a real labor of love it, it starts out fun and then it turns into an actual job oh yeah <laughs> but you don't have a lot of tiny go experience yet you don't have any web assembly experience when you start this book so is the idea that i'm going to leverage this writing of a book to learn this stuff exactly that's exactly what i did i was <laughs> i definitely was no expert for tiny go at the point uh, when i start writing the book but I, I i was totally sure i'm able to learn everything i need to put it into the book but you need somewhat of a project to work on so like what was in your head in terms of a project for the book that would really allow you to explore most of the tech and the and the web assembly so the the, the good part about this was uh, i had the publisher asking me to write a book about the topic so they had also people brainstorming with me about ideas and how could it look like and what should be in the book and whatnot and the idea was to write a book uh, which only consisted of um, more or less hands-on sessions so every chapter in the book you have a single project and the, pro and the project you start, um, every chapter starts a project and uh, at the end of a chapter, you finish the project. And uh, so it started pretty simple with uh, some LEDs being lit up in the first chapter. And then you, uh, we, uh, you uh, create a traffic light uh, thingy. And then um, so at some point in time, you create um, an automatic plant watering system, you know, with a pump and all of that. And at the end, See, the problem here is you're, you're doing these projects, but where do I go and buy the parts? Is there like a, a, a place I can go to buy all the hardware I need to go through the examples? Um, most of the stuff, um, when you search the internet for, I don't know, Arduino starter kit, for example, you get like 90% of the parts needed for the complete book. And the rest of these 10%, like you need to pump for water or so, well, uh, what I did was I just uh, went to Google, <laughs> looked for um, aquarium water pump, so water tank pump or something like that, found the pump for a few cents and just bought it. I'm, I'm going to imagine that at some point you start to create a relationship with the tiny go developers, Ron Evans and that community. Um, talk to me a little bit about that. When do you start to build that relationship? Was it before or like during writing the book? Um, I'd say uh, this relationship started when I was writing the book. Um, before it was like uh, I was just hanging around in the um, tiny go slack and uh, asking a question from time to time. But when I started writing the book, <laughs> I also started asking a lot of questions, an awful lot of questions. <laughs> and they really happily uh, answered every question and also solved every question I had. I was also um, later. Uh, at a little bit later point in time when writing the book, I also contribute, started to contribute to Tiny, um, Tiny Go. Like I added uh, some drivers for components and also made some fixes for the Wi-Fi driver for the Arduinos and so on and so on and so on. So it uh, definitely I started to build some kind of relationship there. Yeah? And I, I also have to say the Tiny Go community is such a welcoming, great, helpful community. You should try it out. <laughs> I have you done anything at conferences like Ron Evans is still, you know, running around the planet in big, thick, heavy suitcases, uh, doing demo after demo of what he can do with tiny, you know, before tiny go Ron 
was building tons of Go libraries that could do the same sort of stuff, right? With the little balls that you can run around and uh, drones. And so Go always had some level of support for hardware and IoT. Um, I think TinyGo was a game changer because of how small the binary is now. But have you been going to any conferences? Have you done any anything like that? Oh, yeah. Um, as I was uh, writing and also releasing the book in the COVID era of <laughs> pandemic stuff, uh, where attending conferences was a hard time, I had um, remote experiences and decided to not, I don't not really want to do it again. I don't want to hold a conference talk remotely again. It's uh, kind of an awful feeling to be there and talk into your screen. Like right now it's okay because I see you on the other side. Yeah, you know, I have someone I talk to, but when doing the holding this uh, online conference, I just had more or less an empty screen. I didn't see the audience or I didn't know if anyone is even watching. And it was the worst feeling in my life, I guess. So um, I guess I, I was at the Embedded Fest, uh, which was held in the Ukraine prior to the, uh, prior to the war which is pretty cool. And I also plan to attend um, or also talk, uh, hold talks and conferences in the future. But uh, during this uh, pandemic times, I didn't want to do another thing. <laughs> it wasn't a really good experience. And it's not because uh, the Embedded Fest did something wrong, but solely because of I can't talk to an empty screen anymore. Oh, trust me, I hate talking to black backgrounds with just names on it and I'm constantly <laughs> begging people to turn cameras on. So you know, I feel you. I, I'm kind of curious as you start the journey of learning this to write a book, what was the one thing that you thought was going to be super easy to be able to do and it wasn't? Like that you really struggled and you thought this was going to be a no-brainer and next thing you know you're three weeks in and you can't get it to work. It, it was uh, for one of for my last or prior to, la, to last uh, project and chapter in the book, uh, I needed a Wi-Fi connection and there was an existing library for the chip I was using. So I thought, well, it's an easy one. So I had a project in mind to just have some sensor. It sends data to um, uh, using uh, the MQTT protocol and then have a dashboard and can read data from this MQTT broker. And uh, then I realized this driver isn't really working as expected because it, lo it lost connection all the time or wasn't able to build up the connection to the network. And uh, at this moment, I, will, I, will, I was nearly crying <laughs> because <laughs> I realized I have to go into in there and have to refactor and fix a, a, a Wi-Fi driver. And I have never seen a Wi-Fi driver before in my life. So that was pretty hard. You would have thought that that was a solved problem too. Like you couldn't have been the first one trying to do Wi-Fi. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't the first one, uh, but um, it was some kind of working. But as I said, it lost connection pretty often. It, it had lots of problems at this point in time. And well, it, no one uh, re really said this uh, driver is in a final implementation and it's done and working. I just assumed it's working. <laughs> now... I'm curious, since you, it's, it was like holding a connection problem, are you able in like 60 seconds to describe what you found and how you fixed it? Was it a simple, like, obvious thing that somebody missed, or was it really, like, technical? Oh, it, it was more a, a technical problem because the, I guess it's called Wi-Fi 9 Nina driver in the, in the chip, um, there is no really good documentation about it. Uh, so you don't have a documentation which tells you what functions do what in depth. So you have, there was a lot of work where you have to guess. <laughs> and uh, so if you have done something wrong, like you sent uh, the wrong bytes to this Wi-Fi chip, it just dropped the connection. And it's happened from time to time and you have to find out why and what. And it's hard to debug uh, such uh, devices. So uh, what I've also learned writing the book is it's hard to debug hardware. So now you need the next book is going to be on debugging hardware. Yeah, yeah. I, I also, yeah, it, uh, uh, it was after the book, I, I um, bought my first debug hardware debugging device. <laughs> because I learned uh, it's helpful. You just started a new job as a software developer again on higher, like, applic you know, let's just say layer seven stuff. Um, I have to imagine after writing the book that you would love to have a job that 
allows you to work on this stuff full time for tiny go is that kind of on your radar screen at all oh it was uh, on my radar screen but i didn't know where to apply to do such things i know some companies that uh, actively use tiny go um but uh I didn't really want to apply for, um, on American companies, to be honest. <laughs> As you mentioned earlier, at this point in time, it's hard to find a job. So I more, more or less just stick to the German and European market when uh, finding a job. I know of a, at least one person that's in a manufacturing company where they're using this stuff, uh, you know, on the plant, in all the manufacturing equipment in the plant to, to do stuff. Um, how you know they've been doing that for a couple of years so i imagine if you're looking for commercialized tiny go projects it has to probably be in manufacturing right yeah i've i've heard this also in the uh, rep assembly um uh, space because um i know fastly is using tiny go and so that would have been an option but i as i said i didn't want to apply at any American companies because I, I had the feeling that they are too volatile right now in the job market. Are you, or is it exciting that the non tiny go, the regular go compiler now has that WASI support, um, which is what the, the web assembly APIs, right. For like ac accessing devices. And it's almost to me, almost like a BIOS in a sense, right. For WASM. I'd say it's a really cool thing. Uh, the standard Go compiler um, has it, but uh, in my opinion, why use the standard Go compiler for stuff like that when I can use Tiny Go? Yeah, at this point, that's an interesting question, right? When is it okay to use the regular Go compiler as opposed to when you should just switch? I mean, when you're working with Tiny Go compiler, for the most part, you're writing Go, right? You don't have a lot of a lot of the standard library available to you probably don't need those aspects of the standard library anyway. And then you still have a concurrency model, right? At, uh, I mean, when I started to write the book, there wasn't any JSON marshalling or unmarshalling in TinyGo because the reflection package wasn't <laughs> developed enough for it. So that was hard, but um, today you can do JSON marshalling and unmarshalling with TinyGo and so on. So I also don't really see the point why the Go community is really putting work into WASM or WASI support in Go compiler itself uh, when they could also put the time into the TinyGo. Well, the TinyGo is a community project, right? It has its own governance as, as it, so it's probably a big part of it, right? But anything that the Go team does in this space is work that could carry over at some level to the tiny Go project, right? Yeah, that's also true. Yeah, if the Go team does something amazing, uh, the tiny Go team can get, I'd say, at least inspired of how they solve the problem. We're almost out of time here. I, I'm, I'm really kind of curious what you're thinking for the next. You stay at a company for almost five years. So you just started this one. So in 2028, you know, one, it'll be interesting to see if you stay here for five years. And it would be super interesting for me to see if you're not switching into some tiny go role, if it pops up, but kind of where's your head in terms of what you want to, what do you want to be working on in the next year? Not, not company wise, but um, project wise, right? Like what's on your radar right now? What do you, what is, what are you looking to do in the next six to 12 months? As uh, we have a current more or less heat wave in Germany, I realized I want to automate the process of process of getting air into my room. So measuring it's, I already built a system to measure humidity and temperature and, you know, and um, get a notification on the dashboard when I should open the window. But a nice little project uh, I'm wanting to do is uh, use that message I get uh, that, well, it's uh, to, the humidity is too high or the temperature inside is too high and then automatically open a window to get to get the fresh air into my room because uh except if it's too hot outside you don't want to open yeah, that yeah. window so, so, so i need outside <laughs> sensors exactly and inside sensors compare the two and then decide if it's uh, worth to open the window what and kind of window do you have does it does it push up or does it open like out it opens to the inside, so you have a, a half a circle motion, more or less. 
So you need like a little motor that can also, um, so that's the project you're working on now, a way of automating. Um, yeah, it's, it's still in the process of um, finding an idea how to open it in a good way because I need some kind of arm that's uh, able to do this motion. When you solve this problem, can you please reach out? Because I have a dog that only wants to go outside when I finally sit down on the couch. And I have wanted like even a button, right? A remote button that just, it's a, like a patio door. So it just, it opens like this, right? It's almost the same mechanic that you have. And I would just love a little button on my armchair so I don't have to get up. And this, this dog is mean sometimes. He'll sit at the door. I finally get up and then he'll walk away from the door because he just wanted me up to just now go and pet him, <laughs> right? <laughs> so when you solve this problem with the motor and opening it and all that, you have to let me know because I'm going to buy it. And then what I'm going to do is add a sensor. So when it detects the dog is sitting in front of the door, you can just open it even on the other side, and I have to get up to let them back in. I guess like, for, 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 for the sensor part, you can use an ultrasonic distance sensor because they are ready to use libraries for Tiny Go. And yeah, for the motor part, I guess I, I'm going to find a, a clean, funny solution. I need some AI though. I only, only want it open when it's a dog. And like that dog, I wouldn't want like it open for the neighborhood dog. I, I, I mean, do you know the Go CV project? <laughs> yeah, Ron computer vision project. That. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's able to recognize human faces. I bet it's uh, able to um... recognize my dog. These are real problems, man. I need I need this solution. So I'm counting on you to solve it for your window, and then I can. Now I'm going to fly you to Miami, and you're going to solve it. <laughs> I'm going to fly you to Miami. You're going to solve it for the dog. <laughs> of course, I love dogs. I also have a dog, and well. Uh... <laughs> It sounds like a fun project to do. Yeah, man. This is like, this is why all this tech needed to be built. So I don't have to get up off the couch once I sit down. <laughs> that's, that's hilarious. All right, dude, we are, we are out of time, man. This, this was so uh, awesome to talk to you here. Uh, if anybody wants to reach out to you after listening to the show, Tobias, and we'll put it in the show notes, but uh, what's, a, what's an easy way for people to talk to you? Um, I guess Twitter, email, and sometimes I also look into LinkedIn, <laughs> but Twitter or email are the best ways, I'd say. All right. And Twitter, you're, um, is that newbie underscore games? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Newbie underscore games. Oh, I right, man. Dude, uh, thank you again for, for hanging out with us. I find it interesting that your career is sort of in one place and your hobby is taking you completely in another i think that's kind of cool because you get to work on kind of two different tech stacks um and you'll never write a book again right like i don't know one person who wrote a book that said i want to write i'm ready to write another book are you ready to write another book i don't want to write another book but a new version of my old book because there are lots of things where, where today when i look at them i say oh my god that could have been so much better and also tiny goes evolving in a pace that the book is already pretty old and uh, needs an update, but I never want to write a new book again. Updating the existing one, it's fine. <laughs> That's okay. So you gonna have another release coming out soon, or you just started that work? Yeah. Um, I have to start at work. Uh, at first, I have to, well, talk with the publisher how we are going to do it and, and stuff like that. So I don't think we are going to do it this year, but in the next year, uh, I want to do it. That's fair. That's fair. All right. This is Tobias and Bill signing off from the On Labs podcast. And I hope to see everybody again real soon.